I'm Lara Stein. And I'm Nora Winnie. And welcome, cheers to our second round of coffee and conversation. Yeah, cheers. Good morning. And good morning. So this is our support. This is part one of our support services um, series. And Nora is our pleased resident special education advocate. And she's going to be taking us through what's involved in getting an evaluation if you want to learn more about your child's, um, about how your child learns. So let's get into it. Yes, so let's why, get into it. Why would someone get an evaluation? That's a really great question. And I think it's something that, you know, is often asked by parents or family members or even teachers. And I think ultimately it's really to get more information about how your child learns and what are, you know, the best ways for them to learn as a learner. It's only beneficial in terms of, you know, finding out about some strengths, some areas of growth. Um, but really the goal is to learn more about your child in ways that like we don't necessarily see on the surface level. So that is the first. Um, other ways sometimes that a teacher might suggest some areas of concern and despite remediation, a child is still performing significantly below grade level. That's sometimes an indicator that an evaluation might be necessary to see if there's something kind of underlying that could be causing you know, the struggle, whether it be with reading, with math or with writing. Um, and other times, you know, we often say like, trust your gut, right? If you as a parent feel like something doesn't feel right here and despite the support and despite what teachers might be saying, like, I don't know, something, something feels a little off. You can always, always, always get an evaluation to just kind of see if something's going on. If you get an evaluation, does that mean you have to follow through with a service? Not at all. An evaluation is totally non-binding. It's really totally within the parent control. And I think that that's something that we want to really express during this whole series is that parents have such a huge part and right in this whole thing that at any point, if you choose to stop, if you choose to, you know, not continue on, that's your right and your choice. So it doesn't bind you to anything. And ultimately at any time you can say, all right, I, I need to pause. I need to stop. So what is on an evaluation? It's a really great question. And it's a, you know, it's a little bit tricky because there's definitely two big paths um, that people tend to go when, when seeking an evaluation. The first is public. So we'll talk a little bit about a public evaluation first. So that really relates public to- Public school, you mean? Exactly. So that relates to kids who are like in public school or often uh, charter schools that are publicly funded where um, basically within the Department of Education, a school psychologist will do what we call a psychoeducational evaluation. And really what that looks for is to get an overall sense of a child's IQ. And they perform subtests within academics to get the sense of like, how is this child performing in comparison to same age peers? So looking not necessarily at grade, but like where you are age-wise, you know, and they do like norm norming around it so that they can get a sense of like, what's average performing, what's low average and high average. Um, and a lot of those times, those subtests are about early literacy skills, early math skills, comprehension, fact fluency, some problems um, solving as well. Um, and usually within a public evaluation, those tests are sometimes connected to what um, is in IDEA, which is federal law that looks at 13 categories that a child could place within a disability. So that's just, um, IDEA is um, Individuals Disability Education Act, and it kind of outlines you know, a core 13 of disabilities that these tests can kind of look for. Okay. And what about in the private school? So in the a private route, but again, not limited to kids who attend private school, it can be anyone that, you know, chooses to go that private route is, again, they do the same kind of psychoed IQ testing to get a sense. But what's different about a private is that oftentimes it's performed by a neuropsychologist. And so what that means is that at times more subtesting can be done or deeper results can be found, especially if you're looking for certain, you know, disabilities are not within the 13 categories, which we'll get into at a different time. But, you know, a neuropsychologist is really trained to use a DSM-5, which is like this huge textbook um, of different disabilities to be able to really pinpoint a little bit deeper in depth what's going on. So 
if you suspect you have your child has needs speech, for example, um, will the these tests in the public school assess for those as well? That's a great question. So within public or private in both situations, um, these tests do not assess for them. So you have to kind of get additional testing like a speech and language um, assessment, an occupational therapy assessment, a physical therapy assessment and counseling are generally like the core of um, subtest or additional testing that are done. Yeah. Um, and that can be done either publicly through, you know, public evaluators, or at, again, you can also seek private as well. Um, and sometimes insurance kind of has a little bit of sliding scale with those too. So you have to request, you have to say, I, I suspect my child has speech language um, difficulties. I'd like that to be assessed as well. Exactly. And I think, Lara, that brings up a really good point, which is in general, at any point in this process, if you want to go through an evaluation, no matter if it's public or, or private, you really do want to put into writing um, what your concerns are and the kind of testing that you want done. Um, so that's true for any kind of subtest, and that's true even for just overall academic concern. Okay, so you've come to the decision that you want to get an evaluation. So as a parent, what are my next steps? So you said put it in writing. Great question. So I think there are certain steps that we want to break down for you guys. So the okay. first step is to put it in writing and to submit a letter. And we actually have a sample letter um, that we can kind of walk through as a little bit of a guide for everyone. So um, this really pertains a lot to if you're in a public or a publicly funded charter school, a little bit more so than um, students that attend a private school. So what you really want to do is if you're ready to go through this process, this is something you want to do, again, you can still pull out at any time, you want to put into writing um, that you would like to have an initial evaluation or a reevaluation if your child already has an IEP, which we'll discuss again a little bit later, um, to the CSE. So something that's really funny about special education is everything is kind of in acronyms and in different yeah. short down words, <laughs> which can get really confusing. So, so confusing. And I, I was know. here and I, I still... I'm lost. And every year there's new acronyms, like you think you got it and then new ones come up. So CSC stands for Committee on Special Education, which is a whole office in and of itself that really, you know, works towards um, getting students the support that they need. So if you're really going through with this process, you're like, yes, let's do it. You want to put into the letter four big things. So the first is your child's name, their date of birth. Um, their grade and the name of, of school that they go to. In the city, um, kids are assigned uh, like a week, like an ID number. And if you have that information and can put it in, that's great. If not, it's not a major concern. The school can kind of help you out with that. The second big thing I really want to put in um, a description of your concern. So that is not limited to just, you know, things like reading and writing. It can include concerns with daily living habits at home that you notice. It's not confined to just what's happening in school. It can be what you're seeing at home too, which is important because we want to know what you see too. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you want to, as we were saying before, you know, the uh, psycho ed is kind of like for sure going to happen. You want to also just put into writing what other additional evaluations you would like um, to happen. So like we said, for speech or um, physical therapy or occupational therapy. And then the last is just your address, a phone number and your signature. Um, again, the address and phone number, you could even add an email in there if you really want. You just wanna make sure that like whoever needs to contact you can contact you in the best way possible. Um, and we have a little sample letter here for anyone that's interested, but this will be kind of up as a resource uh, from the website, or also if you are interested in kind of learning more about that process, you can always let Lara and I know and we're happy to talk a little bit more. But I would say the core four um, is really important when writing a letter. Okay, great. All right, so we'll post that up on the website for sure. Right. Um, okay, so after you've submitted the letter, and I'm sorry, and if you are in private school, you don't great do you question so if you're if you're in private school i think for anything just to have it on, on in writing and record even if you just submit it to the school to say like you know we're having some concerns um this is this is the next step we're going to do just so there's some kind of documentation but yeah. it's um the same as you know submitting to the committee on special education because 
Um, private schools are a little bit different in that they don't have to adhere to the same kind of um, system and also compliance the way that um, public and charter schools do. So in this instance, you can go straight to the neuropsychologist. Um, oftentimes schools might even have a list of recommendations. Your pediatrician might even have some recommendations as well. And um, you can find out what health insurance is provided or not, or if there's sliding scales. Um, and also there are tons of organizations that you can always call and get some information on. So Child Advocacy Network is one. I know Lara and I are obsessed with Child Mind Institute who also does um, some testing as well. Uh, you can always give different places a call to get some uh, additional resources as well to see like what's the right fit for you. Okay, great. And, and sorry, when you, I just want to go back to the public for a second. I'm sorry. Yes. When you've written that, who do you actually hand that letter to? That's a great question. Um, and the and there's really not like a one answer. So you know, I think the best to do thing, the best person to go to first is if within your school there is um, a director of student support or even a school psychologist on staff, anyone that is like kind of seems to be in charge or dealing with student support, that would be like my first line of defense to give it to. You could give it a to a teacher who could then pass it on, but at least this way, if you're giving it to someone who you know will be involved in the process, it's a way to introduce each other, to meet each other and make sure that letter gets to them um, right away. In charter schools, you know, not every charter school has that committee in special education within their buildings or a school psychologist. So again, teachers, or you want to look for someone like who is similar to me, who is, you know, uh, someone within student support who can then get your letter to the Department of Education because we kind of play a liaison with each other to make sure that your letter is submitted and finalized. Okay. All right. So then I've submitted my letter and now what's your letter? So check. Congratulations. You <laughs> it's a bit, I know it's like a, you, you want to like really pat yourself on the back because it's a lot. Yeah, that letter. So, it is. So the second step um, is within um, the public and charter school network is that you're going to be contacted um, that, you know, the Department of Education or the school has gotten your letter like they they know this is what you're seeking um, and that this is kind of where really like the process begins. So um, if you're seeking the public route of testing, you're going to get something um, called a consent form, which basically is just authorizing with your signature that you are giving permission for the school or a school psychologist, you know, those that are qualified to test, um, to test your child within the subsets of what you asked for. So you have to, to sign that to make sure that it's like, yes, I've given permission, we're good to go. Um, and again, if you're going straight to the neuropsych or outside testing, um, you, won't, you won't necessarily be contacted because you're doing it outside. Okay. So that's kind of step two in a nutshell. And then step three. And then step three is the process starts and you get to go through your evaluation process, which um, you know generally has timelines and depending where you live, the timelines differ. So that is really a little bit more individualized, but in general, um, the first step within the public, again, in charter world is what we call a social history intake. So you're going to be contacted by um, someone who is either a, a counselor or a social worker, whether it be that they're in-house at the school or from the Department of Education, and they're just going to ask some questions and do a social history intake. So ask questions like, you know, how was their early child development? Did they go to preschool? Um, you know, what were, when did they first start talking? Which is hard to have all that information on hand and that's okay, but it's really just to get a sense of the trajectory of like how we got from being a baby to where we are now um, overall. And also a little bit about the family. After that, there's also um, a classroom observation that happens. And so that's when the same person generally who does the social history intake or another teacher will do a classroom observation of the student to get a sense of like, you know, how they're performing within their class as well. Um, and then once that's done or sometimes in conjunction, the evaluations are conducted. And again, you're gonna get in writing like when your appointments are, what time they are. So you kind of know exactly where you need to be and when. Got it. Okay. Now, is this the same process in elementary school, middle school, and high school? That's a really great question. It, it is the same process, except for the fact with high school, something that's really unique is that once you're usually 14 years old, it's kind of 
a parent and family choice if you want your student to participate in the IEP meeting, if you want them to, you know, hear kind of what's going on and what are their strengths and weaknesses and having, you know, a real advocacy conversation around, you know, what their learning style is. Um, and the only other difference too is that at a certain age, kids will get a vocational interview. And that's really just asking like, kind of what are some of their aspirations? What are some of their likes? What, you know, kind of jobs do they have at home? Um, to really get a sense of like, what's kind of their plan after high school in a very non-judgmental way, but just to kind of start to pick kids' brains um, at that too. Um, and within an IEP for kids that age, there is a whole section that's dedicated to their transition plan. So what happens for them um, after high school? And for some kids, you know, they stay within the special education system and get IEP services up to 21, depending on, you know, what is going on. So it, it does differ for sure for high school in that sense. So then what what is step four? So what happens next? So step four is congratulations. <laughs> You've worked your butt off and you're finally at the IEP meeting, um, which is great. And so my biggest hat tip for that is to ask lots and lots and lots of questions. You know, I think it's really, really important. And, you know, just to think about off the top, some great questions to ask is like, yeah. when a school psychologist is talking through even the neuropsych, I think no matter who tests, um, you know, you want to ask questions like, oh, what does this percentage mean? What does this number mean? How, how does that relate to my child and how they're performing? Can you explain what this test is testing for? Because they all have names, but you deserve to know, like, what exactly is this looking at? Um, another is how does this impact my child overall in school or at home? So for instance, let's say they do a phonological awareness assessment and there's a deficit there. You can ask like, how does that affect them as a reader? So phonological awareness is things like even early rhyming, you know, and you can ask, oh, well, how does rhyming impact them as a reader later on to get some suggestions along the way? Uh, a big one is obviously always make sure to ask for a copy of the results so that you can have that copy for yourself too um, and be able to keep track of everything that's going on. Um, and as always, a little sidestep before this one, I always recommend having a pre-IEP meeting. We can even call it step 3.5 before 4. I think it's really, really great to just sit down and have a meeting with, you know, school staff or teachers, whoever's relevant to your child's education. Mm -hmm. um, just so that you can get a sense of like what your concerns are, what their concerns are, you know, and really all be on the same page and get a sense of like what it is that we want to advocate for, what are things that we both feel good about, what are next steps, um, to make sure you're all working collaboratively as a team. Okay, so then that's for in the public school. Now, what if you are meeting with your private evaluator, if you're working with the neuropsych, I, what kind of questions would you ask? I think you can ask very similar questions when you're first debriefing, like what's in the report itself. But I, and I would always also recommend to have a second person there with you to hear that information that you trust. I think sometimes in both instances, it's so overwhelming to hear all this information and having, you know, a partner or someone there, whether it be family or from the school to just like take it all in, to take notes with you is really helpful to then like process, digest and reflect. Um, and I think the other thing that I would really think that differs within a neuropsych is you can say, you know, that we're going into this IEP process. So what recommendations from a neuropsychologist perspective could I recommend? Here, so you hear it out loud um, and then ask, can you please show me in the report that highlights this information? Um, you know, where or how, what's the language that helps support that I think is really um, helpful as my cat tries to climb through my screen. <laughs> Welcome to working from home, right? <laughs> What's the difference between the private and public evaluations? Yeah, so I think what you're getting on those reports. I think that's a that's a really great question. So the difference between the public and the private again is that the Department of Education really is looking at 13 classifications when reading the results of all the testing to determine eligibility um, for a child and if an IEP um, is within those 13 and fits. Um, I think it's really important to say that there's been some legislation to get dyslexia on there. Um, we're not fully there yet, but it's definitely being pushed. And I think that's really important to know. Granted, yes, we could have learning disability on an IEP, but you know, 
dyslexia and a learning disability, as we both know, are not the same thing. So um, it's it's important to really think about that too. Um, so if you suspect your child has dyslexia, you have to go to a private evaluator. I would recommend it. I think you could do, you know, a, I think you can do a public, but just you might not get your, you might not yield the results that you want is really, you know, what it is or what it is you're really looking for, because sometimes not all the subtests can be done within that public evaluation, um, especially if a child is performing on grade level, which is something that we know about some students with dyslexia is that overall their IQ is incredibly high and overall they're performing incredibly well and learn other coping strategies. So, you know, something like dyslexia might get, you know, not as looked at in the same way. Um, other things that um, I think it's good to know too is that um, there is a classification that's called other health impairment. And so that sometimes is like, if you have a doctor's note or do have a diagnosis of ADD and ADHD, that falls within that category. But again, ADD and ADHD is not something that specifically um, they can test for. You have to seek outside for that. Right, 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 right. Okay, well, that's really, I mean, it's so disheartening that dyslexia is not yet on there, but at least getting there (laughs) in the right direction. So yes, yes, that's, that's, that's you know, that's real positive. So the number one thing that families ask me, and I just got this question last week, actually, is if you get an IEP, does that IEP follow my child for the rest of their life or for the rest of their you know, education, life? I think that's such a good question. And I think, you know, that's something that's really a little bit scary about this process. And I, I've used this analogy a lot. Um, you know, when we're sick or something is bothering us at some point, you have to go to a specialist, right? If my ear is continuing to bother me, I went to my general physician, you know, they did what they could do, but still something is off. Eventually I'm going to go to an ear specialist to get it checked out. I think this is the same as your brain. Eventually you need the specialist to do the work of a doctor to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, I think thinking about it like that, the same way you would treat a different ailment of your body, when you think of your brain the same way and how you learn makes a, a little, it makes it a little bit softer. But to go back to your initial question, this is not something that has to follow your child for their life. This does not affect their career. This does not affect like what they choose to do as an adult or beyond school. Um, I think it's important to know that at any time you have the right to stop services, at any time you have the right to say like, I no longer want this for my child. Um, and I think there's also a point where you where within these, so once a child does have an IEP, there are meetings every year that we call an annual meeting. And the goal is that at some point your child does phase out of having an IEP. That's everyone's goal is that they get the services that they need in place. We monitor progress over time and slowly when appropriate, we scale back. And then for many students, they don't need it past a certain time. And for others, they continue it through high school. And then as soon as they graduate, you know, it's not like colleges look at IEPs. Kids generally have to self-identify with um, a college to let them know what additional support they might need. But this by no means is something that like is the dooming cloud over their head. If I were to, uh, let's say my child's in public school and I'm applying them to private school, do I have to let, does the private school know that my child has an IEP in public school? Does the private school know that your child, I'm just gonna make sure I get your question. Does the private school know that your child has an IEP in public yeah. school? That's totally your right and your information to divulge. You don't have to self-identify. Quite frankly, I would recommend it because I think the school would wanna know so that they can best support. But remember, they're not within this department of education system, private schools, have flexibility in terms of what they do in every school and every city is different. So even though I may know the rules of New York really well, it could change the second and even sometimes if I go to a different borough. So, you know, you you really have the choice of what it is that you choose to tell the school. I so then what if, know the better, a, what if I'm in a public elementary and I am applying my child to a public middle? Do they get the IEP? 
So what would happen is they might not necessarily get a copy of the IEP, but within the larger system of the Department of Education, their like online file transfers from one to the other. And that's the same for kids that even receive um, early childhood services, like early prevention within preschool, yeah. where you know, you can look, once they become a part of a school's caseload, you can look them up and see kind of what um, services they got in the past, what if they no longer have an IEP, it will show that they no longer have an IEP and why, like what happened at the last meeting, um, or, you know, why it is that they currently have an IEP, because it is the school's bounded by law, you know, right to serve that child and provide those services. Um. Okay, so but now what if my child is going to college and my kids in high school and they have an IEP, do they or or you know even if they're if they had a private evaluation, if they go to college, does the college need to know about my child's received services? They don't. They don't. And it's what totally if I self -report. I think if you want it, I think that's great. I actually think it's a huge benefit. You know, I've worked with many students who've written their college essays about, you know, what it means to be a student with an IEP and a disability. And they're fantastic and really meaningful. And it really teaches, you know, students self-advocacy. So you can, you can totally look for colleges. There are many, many schools where they either have an office that's to get, that's dedicated to students support themselves. And, you know, colleges don't offer the same kind of services that we do within, you know, high school and middle school and elementary school. But that's not to say they don't have an office that has tutors, that has note takers, that has, that make sure you get your extra time if that was something that was really beneficial to you. Um, so those are things that can still happen. Uh, you just have to self-identify. And I think it's a great exercise in self-advocacy to say, you know, hi, my name is Nora. Like, I, you know, was a student in high school who really struggled. Here's a copy of my neuropsych. This was the supports, you know, schedule a meeting and sit down with someone to see what kind of support you can get. Yeah. Nora, thank you so much. This was so informative. I mean, you really answered so many of my questions. So I really appreciate it. And Nora is the pleads pleased special education advocate. So she also can work with parents who are going through this process and answer any questions and you know she she's here to be a support to you so please contact us to work with Nora thank you so much thanks guys and we'll see you at our next support service student support service series yeah so we're really excited because this is only phase one and we're learning on this together and you know listen special education law and everything within special education changes so we're here for you. We're learning together. If we don't know an answer, we're going to be the detectives and find it out. But we're excited to have you join us in the next part of our series. Bye.